we have had such a good time at Reboot 2020. I mean, like the quality of speakers has been outrageous. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started because the quality is going to continue with Jacob Helberg. Um, thank you everyone for sticking with us today and thank you for joining our conference. Um, I am speaking, as I said, with Mr. Helberg. He is a senior advisor at the Stanford University Cyber Policy Center, which is definitely one of my favorite sources for good, solid reporting on cybersecurity and misinformation policies. He is also an adjunct fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Jake has done amazing things for him to be so young. He co-founded a geopolitical risk company, a forecasting company called GeoQuant, and he worked for Google to help anticipate global risks um, and was on the disinformation train before disinformation was a word that we were all tweeting about. Um, so today we are going to talk about uh, US policy towards China um, in this administration, in the next administration, what it should look like. Um, so for the audience, we are gonna take just a couple of questions. So get them queued up for the end and that is it. So Jacob, from my perspective, our current foreign policy has been very haphazardly, very sporadic, and even more so with China. And for me, that is extremely bothersome. But I do understand that other people don't feel that it is the same. How do you think about this? What do you think about our current policy towards China? Well, I think, uh, let me preface uh, my uh, a critique of the current administration with an acknowledgement that I think um, there were a lot of sacred cows in our policymaking community generally that have been um, revisited over the last four years. And I think in a way that's been a healthy exercise for a lot of people. Uh, it's it's called upon us all to revisit some of the assumptions that we've been operating on that uh, some of which have been out of date for a while. Um, with that being said, as you rightly pointed out, the one of the, the central issues and themes uh, from the current administration has been that uh, it has been operated in a way that's uh, quite haphazard. And in fact, I don't think that's a partisan comment as much as uh, I think a lot of conservatives would have appreciated uh, pursuing the, the pursuit of conservative ideas in a more organized way. So um, I think the next administration with respect to China, I don't wanna get ahead of Vice President Biden's ability to uh, articulate um, what his foreign what his foreign policy towards China is going to be. But uh, what I do know is that there are four main pillars that will heavily influence the next administration's approach, approach to China. The first is the fact that uh, Vice President Biden has formally acknowledged and publicly acknowledged human rights abuses in Xinjiang as genocide, which is a very, very big step um, that even the current administration hasn't taken. Um, obviously, it has a lot of consequences because um, uh, one doesn't necessarily negotiate with genocidal governments on um, uh, in, with it lightly uh, without, uh, without seriously considering the gravity of what's taking place there. The second is the vice president's uh, Made in All of America plan is, uh, will simply in uh, a very mechanical way likely require upholding a tougher line on trade in order to uh, stimulate and reinvigorate manufacturing here at home. So the vice president has a plan that uh, aims at, um, at reinvigorating domestic manufacturing and doing achieving that objective will likely require upholding a tougher line on trade. The third is, as you pointed out in your initial point, um, uh, I think a central theme that we're gonna see in this new administration is going to be better coordination with allies. And I think that's a good thing. I think regardless of what party you belong to or what your political persuasion is, America has is incredibly blessed to have a network of allies around the world uh, in the North Atlantic with Europe. And it also has friends, thankfully, in the Pacific, South Korea, Japan, Australia, um, it has uh, an opportunity to forge a new relationship with India. I think all of these things are a great development for American interests, for uh, the uh, American worker, as well as American companies and democracy. And, and I think that that is something that 
um, we're likely to see as a central theme in uh, the way that the United States approaches the relationship with China. Lastly, uh, the last pillar is that I think you're going to see an administration that will be willing to engage with China, not exclusively with China, but will be willing to talk with China and work with China on addressing transnational issues that are not politic inherently political, but that impact the entire planet, including climate change, particularly climate change and denuclearization. Uh, so denuclearization, obviously I'm referring to the, especially the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, um, where China is obviously a key player. So I, I would say um, if I were to predict, and my prediction is as good as anyone, anyone else's at this point, um, uh, I think those four pillars are will heavily influence the way that the next administration approaches um, the United States' relationship with China. So I, this is a great way to start this conversation because you definitely hit on four things that I want to talk about. Um, so this is exciting. Let's start off with uh, Vice President Biden's um, kind of declaration on genocide. Now, you know, you are a very well-educated man, as is most of our listeners. You know, America is no angel when it comes to um, its history and how it's treated people, right? But now we are we're doing our best to try to turn this moral ground and kind of uphold post-World War II ideals about democracy and, you know, good liberal policy, which means that we can't just, you know, be as buddy-buddy and as cozy with China as we have been, as previous administration said, was the good idea to be. Um, so if Vice President Biden wants to keep this balance between they are our, one of our largest partners, they also have a huge control over the over other countries to which we are uh, trading partners with. Um, but in that exact same breath, we can't keep coming to the table with a country that is being accused of genocide against its weaker minority. So how do you think if you were at, you know, the national security table and you were able to have a word in on how to balance these two very strong competing issues, what would you say? Well, um, past administrations have had a tradition called dual tracking, um, which basically means completely decoupling uh, principles that are core to who we are as Americans with other aspects of our relationship. That in practice uh, has meant being able to stand firm on issues of human rights and speaking out on issues of human rights, even if we are having separate and parallel conversations about issues related to denuclearization and, and, um, and climate change and, and these other types of issues. Um, the, the challenge is that in the real world, it is really hard when you're an administration that's trying to get things done to truly delink those two things. And I think uh, a, that is going to be a challenge that any administration, including the next one, will have to face is how to make progress on uh, issues like climate change and denuclearization while at the same time standing true to um, to principles that are core to American interests, especially the rule of law, human rights. These aren't details. I mean, we are talking about genocide and that's a crime against humanity. Um, I'll just add that it's true that America has an imperfect past and track record with respect to human rights. Um, with that being said, I would argue as uh, someone that is, is very proud of this country and, and you know, to be living here as an American by choice who moved here from Europe, um, that one of the beauties of this country that I've always admired is its ability to self-correct and that at least for all of its flaws, this is a country where people can advocate, can speak freely, can report, whistleblow, uh, in our very raucous media environment. And I think that that's something that is a beautiful thing. And we've just went through four years of an incredibly chaotic administration, but um, the, the the administration, we had a system of checks and balances. The administration still had to work with Congress to get a number of things done. Uh, there is a Supreme Court. So I think it is, uh, it's, it's not a perfect system. No system is, but I, I still think that it is uh, a system that's, I, I would, um, I wouldn't trade anything for it. 
Oh, that, that probably needs to be on somebody's patriotic commercial. That was beautiful. I love it. Um, so speaking of this um, dual tracking idea that, you know, the foreign policy apparatus does operate off of, right? We need to be able to think two thoughts, and even though they might be opposite at the same time. Um, in my head, this brings up how we are currently feeling and thinking about Chinese software applications, internet behavior, behavior on the internet, um, specifically how we behave towards Huawei and CTE. First off, yeah. everyone knows during, what was it Obama's first term or second term or late, uh, early second term, everyone was absolutely up in arms about Huawei. They, they said, let's stop buying them for the, for the federal government. And then Trump came in and definitely put a finer point on that. Mm -hmm. Now we have this issue with TikTok um, and the Trump administration has asked and we're slowly pulling all Huawei materials out of now states, localities and whatnot. Should we be doing the same thing with TikTok? We're gonna keep saying that we need to think about American morals. We need to make sure that we prize and treasure free market principles. Are we, if we, if we keep going down this road of everything China is bad, we don't want them in our system, we don't want them in our market. How closer are we getting to acting like China as opposed to being free loving, democratic, markety Americans? So you're getting at uh, a really important point, um, which is that a number of folks in the media and in academia have been trying to make the case or have been highlighting the point that taking actions against Chinese technology companies could be tantamount to replicating Chinese behavior. Um, I, I want to be clear about this, that what sets the U.S. apart and other democracies apart from China isn't that our markets are completely unfettered and that their markets have rules. Uh, in other words, it's not that our Internet is totally borderless and ungoverned and has no rules and that theirs have laws. Um, what sets our market apart is that our market has governed by laws that are democratic. Uh, our Internet is a democratic Internet. Uh, we're a democracy and China is an autocracy and their laws are authoritarian. Uh, they, their internet is uh, authoritarian. And that is a really fundamental substantive difference. Every country has rules. Germany has a hate speech law that applies to internet companies. Uh, so one could argue, does that count as cyber sovereignty, quote unquote? Um, the law, as you know, uh, there are laws, in, as you know, in the, in the United States that are being advocated to ban or flag, uh, quote unquote, fake news, um, which could also meet, you know, by some definitions, uh, this concept of cyber sovereignty. Um, so to me, it's not so much about sovereignty. The, the chip has sailed. The Internet is increasingly looking more like the physical world. It has laws just like our physical markets. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question is what the substantive difference between those laws and the fact that in the United States, in Europe, in India, those laws are democratic and in China, they're not. And one crisp example uh, as to why that is a substantively profound problem is the fact that in China, you have laws like the national intelligence law and particularly article seven of that law yep. that basically requires companies to assist the Chinese government in almost any and every intelligence request that the Chinese government has, including requiring employees of a company to uh, provide that assistance without notifying um, their, their employer that they are in the process of assisting the Chinese government on an intelligence request. So it's incredibly far reaching. That is the thrust of why so many people are concerned about cybersecurity issues with China. It's about access and integrity. It's twofold. It's if we have, if we depend on engineering systems, whether it's supply chains or software systems in China, we, our access could get jeopardized and cut off uh, from one day to the next. And number two, it, the integrity piece is if we have engineering systems in China, they could be, there could be back doors in those systems they could get subverted in ways that we don't, we aren't even fully aware of. Um, Peter Thiel at a conference described uh, this phenomenon as the eye of Sauron that sees all things in all places at all times. And I think it's a very apt analogy. It's it, that is 
the reason why so many countries are concerned about TikTok, which uh, seems benign because it's a dance app, but it actually collects an enormous amount of data from your cell phone that have nothing to do with dancing. Um, it, it collects your, your clipboard data, which means that if you're copying and pasting your email and password, it now has your email and password to a bunch of your accounts. Um, it, it collects your location data every 30 seconds, um, and Huawei, which is a uh, which which would be the physical infrastructure of um, our five G uh, internet, um, basically would be the 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 foundation for everything that sits on top of the internet, um, which which would be a huge cybersecurity uh, uh, exposure. So, I think that the the merits the cybersecurity merits are more than um, uh, more than credible, and and frankly, I think that's why you're seeing a lot of countries around the world, despite the fact that President Trump was personally very unpopular, a lot of countries around the world have really come around to um, uh, the basic idea that the cybersecurity risks were sufficiently high in order for them to choose not to, to go with Huawei for the infrastructure of their country. Um, France has not put it in a ban, but they have basically said that they're going to opt for the European solution to 5G, Nokia and Ericsson. Yeah. The UK has obviously come around. Germany is now slowly coming around. Australia, Japan, country after country, India, which is obviously a very large market. Um, country after country, governments are choosing to uh, opt to not work with Huawei. And the reason is is simple. It's, it is a massive cybersecurity um, vulnerability. And they're not opting, the United States uh, promoting this position is not something that is benefiting an American company. The alternative to Huawei right now is Nokia and Ericsson, which is a Euro which are European companies. So it's not like it's entirely self-serving where uh, if they don't pick Huawei, they're going to use Google. Uh, right now, people are turning to European companies. The, the basic stance of advocating against Huawei is entirely based on the cybersecurity concern. So you said an absolute mouthful, all of which, if I could just like, drop a it, hand clap me. I'm passionate about this issue, so. I am too. That's I knew we were going to have a great conversation. So yeah. this makes me very happy. I, I feel like the biggest issue I have is like where to start. So this is how we feel. This is how a lot of our allies are starting to feel about the threat of Huawei in their systems, especially when you know, in, in East Africa, for example, you know, they were like, oh, please, we'll definitely come and build this for you. We will do all these things and it's going to be so great. And you're going to upgrade your telecommunication systems. But then we 110% saw what happened at the African Union, right? Um, so I am glad that people are starting to think about this in this way. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful. The other thing, though, that I am concerned about, especially when we think about our policy towards China, in my head, it also reflects our policies, like what we're doing in the United States. So aside from their ability to build and manufacture beautiful, low cost, fun technology that they can then disperse across the world for their own intelligence acquisition and business purposes, they are being very, very strategic and I'm not particularly mad. They're being very strategic in how they are thinking about the tech of the future and how they're going about collecting rare earth minerals and things that are going to be the driving force to the types of engineering and technology that's going to create um, uh, tech for to help with climate change, 5G, all these other things. Um, I think one of the, the, the biggest stories that I that I had heard anecdotally, anecdotally um, was about how they were going through how the Chinese government was going through all of the minerals that they think are going to be needed for uh, battery storage. And it made me think about, wow, it, it's not just banning X company, because once X company is banned, another company is going to come up because they're already thinking about the tech far, far in advance. So I'm, I'm wondering what you think and, and how America should go about changing our own strategic policies so that we can be very, very competitive. And so that we are thinking about technology acquisition and manufacturing and what literally it's going to take to make tech in the future. So that when we think about US and China policy, 
it's not always a tit for tat. It is a how do we make America better? Um, right. Yeah. Um, so I would divvy up my response into two parts. The first is what do we do on the demand side of the market? On the demand side of the market, we need to, the United States, and this is something that um, the Vice President Biden's team has talked about quite a bit, but there is a new opportunity for the U.S. to create what some people have called tech alliances. Mm -hmm. um, the Quad um, in the, the Pacific, um, the United States, India, Japan, and Australia have had several discussions about creating a new supply chain alliance. Um, the, that, that model, the a supply chain alliance would be a supply side solution to uh, a supply chain security, but that model could very well be applied to a demand side solution. How do we create a common market um, like, for example, um, what was supposed to be the TPP uh, and ensure that the outer bounds of that market are, is enforced. Um, the, reason that, um, the reason that TPP can be problematic and one of the issues that the next administration will have to grapple with is if it creates a trading regime that's large, which is important and necessary, it will have to make sure that the outer, that the outer bounds of that area are protected in terms of uh, to ensure that China doesn't use um, that new trading area as a back door for dumping. So for example, if we had TPP, um, Mexico would be a party to it. It would be incredibly, for TPP to have any value, it would be incredibly important to ensure that Mexico isn't uh, cutting a bilateral deal with China where China sets up a bunch of operations in Mexico and then has a back door into the other country uh, that are signatories to TPP and therefore completely negates the value of having this area because um, because our companies, which are subject to all of the different various rules and regulations and standards articulated under TPP, are now competing with Chinese companies that have access to this preferential trading regime but that aren't bound to the same rules and regulations. So that's on the demand side. On the supply side, um, there have been supply chain alliances, uh, ideas about supply chain alliances that have popped up. Um, there have been uh, ideas I have written about, ideas about engaging African countries. As you point out, one of the necessary inputs for finished manufactured goods is raw materials and natural resources. You need natural resources to actually make manufactured goods. That's why China is so involved in Africa. If the United States and the democracies are to be successful in reshoring their activities outside of China, they're going to have to somehow, some way figure out how to get in, in a cost competitive way, access to natural resources and raw materials. And that might be in Africa. So the solution uh, isn't necessarily to engage in the same kinds of predatory uh, I would argue neo-colonialist tactics that the Chinese government has been engaged in Africa, where it builds a road uh, that only leads from a mine straight to the port uh, and without really benefiting much the local community. A solution could be engaging African countries in ways that empower them far more authentically. Um, that uh, where, where local governments uh, actually have buy-in and are stakeholders uh, in uh, and, and beneficiaries of, of this trading uh, relationship. So uh, those are just a few ideas of, uh, how, um, of how the United States can reinvigorate its uh, manufacturing operations. There are a whole slew of, of add-ons that would I think would be necessary. Like for example, the fact that we do have a mechanical engineering shortage in the United States and frankly across the democracy simply because the microeconomics of our economy far more reward um, uh, software engineering over mechanical engineering. Uh, there is an immigration component to it where just like when a startup recruits and builds a team, uh, it has to have the best and the brightest. Uh, uh, countries operate you know, in ways that aren't that dissimilar. If we want to have the most innovative workforce, being able to draw the best and the brightest minds from the rest of the world is incredibly beneficial. So there are, there are no shortages of policy measures that the next administration will have to grapple with in order to make this a reality, but these are just a few.
I could not agree more. I definitely think that um, we would probably make a good tag team if we had any type of leverage in the foreign policy <laughs> ecosystem. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes and I'm just scrolling through the chats to see if there's any questions. There is. There are two, but they seem to have kind of already been, been answered. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, move on to my next point, which is the thing that I love about being in a long-term strategic competition um, as scary and as bad and like, you know, uh, that can be is that it requires a whole lot of reflection on what you're doing. And if you are smart, you will definitely look back at history. You will give a very good and clean eye to how your own country is performing. So this conversation, we've talked about the issue of immigration. We've talked about the worthiness of higher education. We've talked about trade and alliances and um, our relationships with other countries, all in, in as part of how we're going to address China. So if there were three things or even five things that you would kind of put on your list of like, if we're going to think strategically in a since we're in this long-term competition with China, these are the three to five things that we have to address first. For example, I would definitely say we have to address our own education and recruitment system. We have a smaller population. We have to have babies that can do math and know science and have easy access to higher education. The reason that we are able to get all this bright and beautiful talent into the United States in the form of immigration is because they can afford to go to our universities and others can. Um, so that's just an example. That would probably be my number one. What would be your you know, top three, top five things that we need to do domestically to improve our strategic competition with China? Um, I would say the top three um, would really be um, infrastructure. I think mm -hmm. making big investments in infrastructure reduces the cost of doing business for everyone. Um, at a very micro level, I remember talking um, with um, uh, beneficiaries of scholarships that used to tell me that uh, they chose to go to a given community college just because it was uh, it had an exit on the subway that um, uh, picked them up near in the community that they lived in. So it just shows how infrastructure can actually have a huge impact, mm -hmm. big and small, for companies to get their goods to market, as well as for people to be able to have access to educational opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise be able to have access to. Um, so infrastructure is a big one. Um, I would bucket education and immigration as one broad hu human capital um, project, yeah. um, making sure that our people are uh, competitive and our workforce is competitive. So education is a big one. We need more mechanical engineers. Uh, frankly, we need more engineers all around, um, but we, all, we also need other types of specialized and skilled uh, labor. So, for example, Tim Cook was interviewed not too long ago, and he was basically explaining during the interview that uh, one of the reasons that Apple had so many of its supply chains in China was actually uh, the cost was one component, but actually a big component was the fact that China just has a, an enormous and abundant supply of very, very specialized workers that know how to operate certain types of technical machineries. They just can't find that elsewhere. Um, so that is something that um, I think doesn't get enough attention. And the last one is trade. Um, okay. I think figuring out and um, uh, modernizing our trading arrangements uh, are are going to be uh, a really big um, endeavor for the future. Uh, and by that, I mean, I also mean governments finding out a way, uh, a better mechanism to enforce trade policies, I think is really key because we've seen over the last few years an enormous degree of public frustration at unfair competition. Trading arrangements are... Uh, are not inherently bad the way that they're written. The problem is, is that a lot of the times uh, rules aren't always enforced. So figuring out ways of enforcing that, I think is gonna be key. 
I could not agree with you more. Jacob, we have to do this again. We have to spend more time with each other at some point. Um, well, because we are just chock full of good ideas and we could talk for hours. Um, but it is a Friday. It is the end of a work day. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, we are just benefited greatly from, from having you on. And thank you to everyone that has joined Reboot. Um, we will see you on Monday for day two. See ya.